It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody, where each week we seek inspiration from great men and women to become the heroes and heroines of our own lives. And you are here with your hosts. I am Andrew Bernstein. You are Robert Begley. How are you doing today, Robert? I am fabulous today, Andy. Excited to dive into the story of the man who has more waterways named after him than anybody else in the world. Yeah, and that, of course, would be the great English explorer, Henry Hudson, yes. who, when he sailed up the eponymous river, was actually sailing for the Dutch on that, that you know, on, on that voyage. But was but you know made several voyages to the New World, sailing for the English, also searching for the Northwest Passage to China. Yes. And so uh, his story is a uh, is one of brilliant exploration and achievement, and there's sad there's sad component, very sad components to his story, also, aren't there? Yeah, absolutely, Andy. And some of the themes I would like to talk about are that he's, as you mentioned, he's looking for the Northwest Passage. Uh, especially coming from the north, northern Europe, he thought you can go like through the ice cap uh, to make it to Asia. And so, but he failed at that, but his failure turned into a success to the, the, which has lasted to this day. So that's kind of one of the themes. How can you turn failure into victory? But another one is when do you admit defeat? Because we'll go into his final uh, voyage which ended in what is uh, Hudson Bay in northern Canada. And his, you know, his shipmates wanted to go back to England and Henry Hudson wanted to go farther west in search of that Northwest Passage. And it didn't end pretty for him. And we have these kinds of choices in our lives. You know, when do you draw the line and say, OK, I got to admit, this is not working. Let's let's turn back. And then the last point, Andy, is the legacy. There are so many, you know, I mentioned waterways, but there's so many uh, objects, monuments to this man. I have a ton of literary uh, quotes that uh, the, the legacy of Henry Hudson is for a man that we only know the last four years of his life uh, are documented. He's left quite a legacy and we'll explore some of the details of that. Right. Waterways and towns uh yes there's a town on the hudson river uh between you know where i live and up you know closer to albany is a small town called hudson hudson yeah. new york right on the yes. hudson river <laughs> named after the same the same man you know so yes his uh his impact on the development of new york as you know new amsterdam originally but right. his impact yeah. on the development of this town uh, mm -hmm. What became New York City, one of the world's great cities, maybe you know some people consider it the greatest city in the world, a, trim, a world center of of commerce and you know and, and trade and also for the arts and and the and the intellectual life. Uh, yeah, and Henry Hudson was the one who I think I think we could say to a significant degree made all this possible. Yes, I, I would agree. And so if we if we just go back in time, he was not the first European to uh, see what is the Hudson River and to explore it. Uh, that was Giovanni Verrazzano uh, in 1524. So a, a full 80 something years earlier. Right. Now Verrazzano uh, was French. Italian. Was he, he, was was he sailing sell for the Spanish? Who was he sailing for? The French. For the French. Okay. He, for the French. But the main thing when we talk about exploration is what is the lasting impact? Right. And there was no lasting impact right. after Verrazano as far as European civilization. Yeah, other there. than having the bridge named after him, right? <laughs> the, the bridge connecting Staten Island with, with Brooklyn, <laughs> Verrazano Bridge. Because he sailed up that, yeah, yeah, he sailed yes. up through that, through that narrow, what they call the narrows. Uh, but yeah, but there was no settlement by the French uh, that, far, that far south. Their settlements were further north. That's right. That's right. And so when Henry Hudson came down, well, let's let's even go back uh, back a little bit. So he's Brit he's born in England, uh, as we said, probably the mid 18 uh, uh, 1580s. Uh, I think Wikipedia has roughly uh, 1585. And not much is known about him, except his uh, I think his grandfather was also in the shipping trade. So he so Henry likely grew up as a boy 
on on ships and learn learn the trade and he joins this one company that has an agreement uh with moscow an english company that trades all the way to moscow um the muscovy company is the name and they're in search of this northwest passage so henry hudson uh goes through the northern uh part of the world and i can even show on on a, a globe here that he's you know, this is the UK and he's trying to come from uh, the north. And if you see this big body of water here, this is actually his name, Hudson Bay. Yeah, it's an enormous body of water. And also, you know, sadly for him and other explorers, there's this even larger body of land called the North American continent that's standing in his way. <laughs> between, yeah, so... <laughs> between connecting the Atlantic and the Pacific and getting to China. That's right. So on that first voyage, he actually did go through the river. Uh, through the unnamed river at the time, uh, but went back to England, uh, 1607. He was in touch with John Smith, okay, who we mentioned a few episodes right. ago with, with Pocahontas. They were both Englishmen uh, who were explorers and, and sailors and tradesmen and uh, traded some notes with Smith, came back again for the same company, 1608, learned a little bit more about navigation and what the terrain was like. And then the the pivotal moment in his life is when he sails for the Dutch, as you mentioned, Andy. And now there's already risk here because the Dutch and the English have been at war uh, for, for some time. We're just at the beginnings of the Dutch... Um, this is their glory days, you know. Yes, yeah, two, two very commercial peoples. Yes, right. The two most, by far, the two most in Europe, the English and the Dutch, and uh, the English had already settled the, um, you know, Newfoundland, John Cabot, and and so they wanted the Atlantic coast, what is now uh, the Atlantic coast. They had yeah, and James, Jamestown, Virginia was it was sixteen oh seven, wasn't it? Was right around Jamestown the time. Jamestown was already Hudson there. Sailed, yeah. Yeah, and, and they they and they sailed the Roanoke colony that didn't yes. that that didn't succeed. Nobody, that, I think to this day, nobody knows how those people died. That's and, right. And, what that's year right. was that Roanoke? Do you remember? Jamestown was sixteen oh seven. I don't know. Right, late fifteen hundreds. Oh, so it wasn't it, even yet sixteen hundred. Was it fifteen nineties? Yes, I think it was. I'm almost I didn't certain. Realize it was it, the, I didn't realize the English had a colony here that early. But yeah, yeah, I know. I know everybody died, and they don't know. To this day, whether they starved to death, froze to death, were killed by hostile tribes or some combination yeah. of that, you know, or some disease killed them. I, nobody knows. But Jamestown, the first successful colony, was 1607, right? Yes. And Henry it, Hudson, for the sailing for the Dutch, sails up the Hudson, what becomes Hudson River. Was that 1609? That's 1609 on the half famous uh, ship called the Half Moon right. uh, with a small crew. But because he's sailing for the Dutch, they see this land, they see this terrain, they see this as a gateway to the to the continent coming in from Europe, a perfect place for a trading uh, a trading hub. And the Dutch, well, as, did, as you little did they know what kind of a commercial center this was going to develop into, right? Yeah, with, with well, Wall Street and the you know, exactly and the center, they, of, center of American it, capitalism. It's true. Well, you mentioned Wall Street, Andy. The Dutch built Wall Street yeah, to right. protect them from the English, yeah, not even the wall, from the natives. Right? Yeah, with a wall, right? Was a wall. There was a literal wall, so you, you can even see, uh, vi you know, viscerally the 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 difference between the Dutch and the English here. And Hudson has this conflict because he's a proud Englishman, but he is. Saying Sailing uh, for the Dutch, so that leaves the legacy there. The Dutch start to uh, get settlements in um, uh, New Amsterdam, which they which they eventually named it. But also the the whole colony of what New York is was New Netherland. So they they went up to Albany, and right. and it wasn't just New York City that they that they kind of so the whole of the Hudson River or big part of it was essential to Dutch. Um, you know, trade, yeah. uh, uh, settlement, right. colonization. Right. You know, last night I had dinner in, in this town up, up, up the river, as they used to say about Sing Sing, uh, up the river, a, a small town called Fishkill. And that's still, that's a Dutch, you know, it's a Dutch name. Oh, kill, yeah. I kill, I think in Dutch means like stream or, you yes. Know, you know, so you know, fish kill. You, you you're yes. on this stream. There must have been fish. Must have been a lot of fish in it at the time when the when yeah. they named it. But yeah, the Dutch influence. You still see. You still see a lot of Dutch names. Um, 
you know, my daughter is uh, your your niece is a junior at SUNY Albany and mm -hmm. uh, doing very well, I might add. I, you know, a small town right. nearby Rensselaer. You know, Rensselaer, New York's a Dutch. That's a Dutch name, isn't it? it sounds after, Dutch to me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's a he was a, a big uh, entrepreneur in, in that area, uh, Rentalia. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. then, then let's, let me say let's say something about the the uh, geography here and the history because I think that's important. Why yes. the Northwest Passage? Why this hassle? You know, trying to get through the the North American continent or through the uh, Arctic polar ice cap. And we touched on this when we, you know a couple of months ago when we discussed Henry the Navigator. You know, yes. because first of all, you want to get to the Far East from Europe. Uh, first of all, the overland trade routes was controlled by by Muslims. Right? It was yep. Arabs who, in this era, set roughly sixteen hundred, were dominated by the Ottoman Empire. You know the Turks, mm -hmm. and uh, there was often hostilities between the Ottoman Empire and various Euro European powers. The Mediterranean was known as Ottoman Lake, and they took a lot of you know European slaves and everything. Yes. Uh, and so that was dicey. And so we we know. Henry the Navigator and his Portuguese sailors found another way to the Far East by going, you know, by going east around Cape of Good Hope and uh, African you know, continent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the African continent through the Indian Ocean into India and then eventually onto to China by that route. But that was sewn up by the by the Portuguese, right? So the Spaniards were looking for a a way to China going west across the. Atlantic. This was Columbus's yes. mission. And here we are, you know, more than 100 years later, and, and non-Portuguese European powers still looking for that Northwest Passage, the, the way to, to the Far East by going by going West. So they right. could bypass one, the Arabic overland car caravan routes, and two, <laughs> the Portuguese method of, you know, sailing around uh, the, the continent of Africa through the, through the Indian Ocean. Hence, you know, the Northwest Passage was was important. But like I said, unfortunately for them, there's this huge body of land standing in their way. You know, it's called, you know, the well, not just the North American continent, but the South American continent also. Yes. And, and again, for Hudson, the Dutch colonies, which or if you look at the eastern coast of the United States, they were called the middle colonies. So they were not it wasn't even just New York. It was Delaware. It was parts of Pennsylvania. And uh, still, as you mentioned, to this day, lots of uh, lots of Dutch names, even if you split uh, Long Island in, in half, Long Island. And if you go up to uh, up through Connecticut, one side, the the western side of Long Island is called Nassau, which is actually Dutch. But the eastern side is Suffolk, which is English. Oh, you and know, that's yeah, that's right. You reminded me of something, Robin. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, Brooklyn, where I'm from. I think it's Dutch means Dutch broken, name. broken land, right? So that I think Dutch, it's a Dutch name, name. yes. Mm -hmm. And what the Bronx, where you're from, <laughs> I, used to tell, I used to tell this to my, my ex-wife, and she didn't believe me, but it's true. Uh, um, <laughs> you know, some Dutch family named Bronx. Jonas you, Bronx. Yeah, yeah, Jonas mm -hmm. Bronx settled there. Yeah. So people living down in, in Manhattan today, was, let's go up and visit the Bronx. You know, the, right. the Bronx, and that's how the Bronx got, you know, the, from this Dutch this Dutch family. Yeah, yeah what was his name, Johannes Bronx? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and so actually, what, uh, just staying on that, Andy, one of, one of my favorite books, Island at the Center of the World, talks about all the Dutch um, innovators. And this this one man, Adrian van der Donk, who deserves a hero show himself, Yonkers is named after him. Uh, yeah. And there's even a park, uh, van der Donk uh, Park. So, yeah, so we know all the, na the names here. And again, the class, just these dividing lines. Harlem is, I went to Harlem right. in the Netherlands, right, you know, right, right. just to see the other one, where, where it came from. So all these, all these neighborhoods, you know, Bedford-Stuyvesant <laughs> is, oh, yeah, and, yeah. and so... Um, Stuyvesant, you know, Peter, Peter Stuyvesant, Stuyvesant was, uh, yeah. was the head of the new, new Amsterdam colony for a while. Ago. Yeah, so so the Dutch, and they were about free trade. We mentioned this in prior episodes. They were about free trade right. and freedom of consciousness, free free thought. Right. You know, Rene Descartes went there. John Locke went there when they were pers you know when they were persecuted in their in their uh, local uh, countries. So the Dutch were way ahead. Well, and even William Lawrence, and Mary. The Glorious Revolution came yeah. from the Netherlands, didn't they? Yeah. What was that, William of Orange? 
That's right, William. That's right, William of Orange. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, sixteen eighty nine. That's right, Glorious Revolution. Yeah. So, and, but he, going to the paintings, the 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 famous Dutch masters. If you notice, like even Vermeer, like the, they had these. Uh, many of the men had these heavy fur hats, and that's from the fur trade coming from the North American continent, you know, all of the beavers that they were trapping. And then they'd send all that fur back over to the Netherlands and that's what they would wear. So this, you know, intercontinental between the Netherlands and New Netherlands was all of this came from Henry Hudson, you know, sailing down that river that has his name uh, yeah, yeah. for the Dutch. Absolutely, absolutely right. You just reminded me of something about the fur trade. John Jacob Astor. Yes, another deserves... Dutchman. Yep. Yeah, who deserves a hero show himself, yeah. you know, you know, was a, became a uh, very well first millionaire. Fur trade. Yes, what I was going to say, they say they say he's the first millionaire in history. And you yeah. already answered the question before before I asked it was was he English or Dutch? So so Astor was yes. Dutch. Astor Vanderbilt. You know, so many of uh, these names. Yeah, Vanderbilt. Dutch. Yeah, Vanderbilt's a Dutch name. And mm. the Waldorf Astoria, of course, was uh, you know, was Astor. Is the, either, at least at least named after him? Or did, did he actually you know found the place and build build the, the Waldorf? Um, it's interesting. Yeah, I don't know if he did it, but Waldorf is a town in Germany. That that's where that name came from. But uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm Astoria Queens. You know, was named after John Jacob Astor. So maybe yeah, maybe, maybe it was his family that was that was in, involved. I would in think so. That, yeah, it's an iconic it's an iconic hotel in New York City, right? Yes, the Waldorf Astoria. Yeah, uh, under renovation for the last couple of years. Every time I go back to New York, I, I'm like, when are they going to finish this thing? They're, they're, you know, keep redoing it. So, so moving on, Andy, we got the Dutch influence and we see how, you know, how basically we can say Hudson turned this failure of not gaining access to the Northwest Passage turns out to be the New Netherlands, uh, New Amsterdam, uh, uh, the Dutch are on on the rise here but the final year of uh, six so he does 1607 1608 sailing for the english 1609 for the dutch goes back to england 1610 england wants to send him again uh, a different venture still pursuing that northwest passage and as we mentioned he goes into this hudson bay and there's a mutiny. The, 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 it's, it's through the winter. They want to just settle in for the winter. But in the spring, some of the ice does melt. And the crew wants to just go back to England. And um, Henry Hudson doesn't. He wants to press on. And there's a mutiny. And they put him and his son amongst uh, several others. I think I Show this here. This is him and his son and a few others in a boat. That's the the, the big ship there, and uh, he's never heard of again. I think June 1611 was the last time anybody saw him. Um, yeah, you know, <clears throat> I was reading. You know, I was reading about this last night, getting mm -hmm. ready for the show, and, and I thought to myself, knowing Robert, he's probably been to Hudson Bay. He's probably swam. <laughs> Probably swam in Hudson Bay. Is that is that right? Have you have you? Have you I have it? not, but I do have a Hudson River swimming story <laughs> when, when we get to that. But no, I I actually have not been. That's a good. That is that is a that's a challenge now. You just yeah. you just threw down the gauntlet, Andy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah I think Robert's already swam in Hudson Bay. You know where well Henry Hudson and his son were last seen. Okay. Yeah. You still got, oh, you, still, you, still got you still got time. <laughs> yeah, but, but anyhow, I, they so they wintered there before the mutiny, right? Yes. The winter of 1610, 1611. Like That's I was right. saying, during the Little Ice Age, that must have been, and that far north in Canada yeah. on the Hudson, that must have been yeah. a brutal winter. I could see why the guy, let's go. As soon as the ice melts, let's go home. You know, but yeah. Henry Hudson and, must have been a tough guy. He wanted to keep, he wanted to keep going west, looking for the Northwest Passage. Yes. And he noticed these birds that had white uh, white breasts and black tails and and black on the sides, which he had never seen before. No, not many from Europe had seen before and you know, hordes of them and they're penguins. And he's trying to destroy in his journals. He's he's trying to describe them. So. Um, so, Andy, that here's an important question. How do you when do you admit defeat? Can we say definitively was Hudson right? Was he was he wrong? Should he have gone back? to England, especially with your son. I mean, that's a, that's a real, to me, that's, 
that's now it's not just your own life or your own making decisions for yourself. That's that's a paradox there. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we know what Mrs. Hudson would have said. You know, was, was she was she there? But um, yeah, I mean, here's, here's what I think. There's a choice. There's a choice that 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 people make. But certainly, uh, once the mutiny was a fait accompli, I, yeah. I, if the I, we don't know, did the mutineers give the captain the, and the the choice of you know coming home with us, whether in bondage or not? If that because if that was an option with with my ten year old kid, yeah, I would have you know definitely yeah. would, definitely would have would have mm -hmm. gone home because staying here in an open boat with very few resources in in very rugged territory is almost certain death. Uh, yeah. So you know, I, I if if that was a, if that was an option, you know, to, to to go home with with the mutineers, whether in command or not, you know, I w I would have taken it. Uh, I mm -hmm. think that would have been the right thing to do. If there wasn't a ten year old boy involved, you know, then then it becomes uh, then I I think it becomes uh, you know more more of, a, of an open question. But even so, if, you know, we don't know, do you know, did the mutineers give them the option of, of going home once the mutiny I actually, was... Actually, yeah, I don't know. They, I, don't, I don't think one, anybody knows, right? We, yeah, uh, Robert Jewett was on him on three different missions and they butted heads a lot. And from what I read, the, Hudson had, he, he was pretty strict with the crew, with mutineers. And he had a chance to actually execute you i think on one of the one of the prior missions and didn't and there might have been a bit of revenge there yeah. because when when the englishmen went back they had to describe what had happened right and you know this is a way to bury the legacy of henry hudson you know right and right. hope you know fortunately that did not happen yeah you know, there's a, one issue here is we, we discussed in the Pocahontas episode is we have one eyewitness account, right? Somebody, somebody right. on the, on, on the ship, yeah. we have, we have their diary. Uh, so he, that's the only eyewitness account we have. So we have to take that very seriously. But on the, on the other hand, as we discussed, you know, in the Pocahontas episode, this guy most likely has an ax to grind. He doesn't want to go back to England and be hanged, you know, yeah. for mutinies. Right. So, that's right. You know, yeah. So his account mm -hmm. is may well be prejudicial. He may well paint Hudson as you know, like Captain Bly, you know, in the right. famous mutiny on the bounty, or the famous mutiny on the yes. bounty case, as a real, as a real brutal taskmaster, you know. And the mutineers, like Fletcher Christian, you know, as as the as the good guys, we don't know. But uh, if it was an option, even without the kid. Uh, I would have gone home even if I had, even if I was in chains. <laughs> Actually, the mm -hmm. mutineers probably wouldn't have the captain in chains because that's that's more of a danger for them to be hanged when they since they're going home. Right, right. They probably would have they probably would have you know left him in command. Um, but but because it's almost certain death, you, and you're not going to be able to find the Northwest Passage in, in an open boat. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I yeah I, I, at that point, if it was an option, we don't we don't know if it was. But if it was if it, if it was an option, because you see, here's the thing: if uh, if they if they swear Henry Hudson to you know to say, oh, like, you won't say anything about the mutiny, but then when he get home, he could talk about the mutiny. Then they're going to be hanged, yeah. you know. So they may well have said, leave him in an open boat, and we'll you know we'll we'll make the, our side of the story will be the only one heard. So yeah, it may not have been an option. If it was, I would I would have taken it, especially with right. with the kid. Yeah, yeah, just just a sad a sad ending to a, a, a lasting life, Andy. And if we now switch over to the to the legacy, we have the Hudson River School of Art. You know, there's there's so much beauty. This this river has so much history, uh, particularly you know in American culture from landmark events. Yeah, West Point. Revolution. West Point is right on. West on Point the, is, the is Benedict on. Arnold story is all, is all tied up. The Benedict Arnold story. Uh, Alexander Hamilton wrote George Washington's farewell address while riding up and down the Hudson from Albany. The Schuyler family was up in Albany. Uh, and he wrote the Federalist Papers, uh, just ferrying from from Albany to New York City. And uh, Revolutionary War battles, you know, it was strategic. The Hudson River was, was strategic there. 
They end up placing the Statue of Liberty at the foot of uh, the Hudson River, New York Bay. Um, then if we go to literature, Andy, our favorite book. Yeah, The Fountainhead. <laughs> the Fountainhead, Howard Rock's first office. There's, I think, 11 references, 11 references to the Hudson in, in uh, The Fountainhead. Howard Rock's first office, he could see a tiny sliver of the Hudson from, from his window. He builds a starter temple uh, up on the northern part of uh, Riverside Park, overlooking the Hudson River. Yeah, near where, in real life, presumably where Grant's tomb. Yes, where, right near where, 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 where Grant's Grant, tomb. Where Grant is, where Grant is there. Uh, Gail Wyman growing up in Hell's Kitchen swam in the Hudson River. Which the, I wouldn't yeah, recommend the, today, but <laughs> I almost did. So when you asked about <laughs> Hudson Bay, so when I was I was a competitive swimmer a couple of decades ago, and there was one race I signed up for, and it, Andy, it was around the entire Manhattan Island. Okay, wow, and really? I was that scared. Is, wow, I, I, yes. I was scared, but I signed up for it, and we had like a uh, how many miles or something. That? It's like 13, I think it's about 13. Uh, That's eight, all around all of Manhattan Island? Yeah. Uh, no, it's 13 miles north to south, tip. So um, it's got to be at least yeah, so, six miles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it was a long, it was a long race. Okay. And, and the currents was, and the currents in the East River are supposed to be. Well, there were, there were going to be like, you know, guided, you know, boats like, you know, <laughs> to save you when you when you ran out, you know, when you stop floundering, when you stop floundering. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I would see the last apartment I lived in in Hell's Kitchen, Forty Second Street. I looked out to the Hudson River every morning for breakfast, and I'd see the massive ships, you know, those tour, those carnival uh, ships going by, the Circle Line, uh, so much activity on this river, so much commerce, and. Yeah, One the intrepid most, the intrepid museum is right. The USS intrepid, intrepid is, is on that is yes, on the Hudson, Hudson River that's docks on the Hudson and the most one of the most famous airplane landings. Okay, remember? Oh uh, yeah, Sully? yeah, <laughs> Sully's Burger. Yeah, oh man, lands right near where I lived. Actually, yeah, the, the movie, the Sully movie, you could see my old building uh, in that because it was right around Forty Second Street. Clint movie. Eastwood. Clint Eastwood where? directed that with Tom Hanks, right? Tom Hanks says, "Yeah, uh, I remember yeah. that it was January two thousand and nine. It was yes. cold. It was cold. It was a yeah. cold day in the New York area. Yeah. And in the film version, the, at the end, they asked the co-pilot, you know, the, the, the pilot, <laughs> if, you 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 done, if you'd done every anything differently, what would you have done? And the co-pilot says, I would have done it in July. <laughs> I would have done it in July. That's a classic. Yeah." <laughs> It was cold hey, <laughs> in, the, in the river. Oh, but just man. the idea, Andy, the ingenuity. Yeah. I'm going to land. This plane is going to crash. I'm going to land it in the Hudson River. I, I mean, nobody just... had ever, nobody had ever, you know, glided <laughs> a jet line, uh, you know, of that size and weight to a water landing. Yeah. And, and you know, so, so, yeah, that was amazing accomplishment. Yeah, so the name, one, the name one, of the movie, Clint Eastwood's movie with Tom Hanks, is Sully, right? Is this, yes, is, Sully. Is, yeah. Yeah. If anybody hasn't seen it, strongly recommend it. It's very good. De definitely recommend that. Yeah. So one quote, uh, my all-time favorite quote, you know, truncated, uh, from which Gail Winant says to Howard Rourke, talks about the skyline of New York. And he says, is it beauty and genius that they want to see? Do they seek the sense of the sublime? Let them come to New York, stand on the shore of the Hudson, Look and kneel. When I see the city from my window, no, I don't feel how small I am, but I feel that if a war came to threaten this, I would throw myself into space over the city and protect these buildings with my body. <clears throat> Ayn Rand, clearly the yes. great novelist philosopher, she's clearly speaking for herself through yes. the character of Gail Wynan. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's no quote. When I lived in, in New York after 9-11, that was my signature uh, quote about wanting, you know, wanting to protect this city. And you mentioned, you know, is it the greatest city in the world? For half my life, I used to brag that it was, but... Uh, it's not, well, it's on anybody's it's short now. list. Yeah, yeah, it's on anybody's short yeah. list. You know, the certainly world center of, of capitalism, you got the Broadway theater, the major universities, major museums, people like yes. J.P. Morgan... You know who helped found the, the the Met, and people like Theodore Roosevelt helped found the Metropolitan Museum of Art. You know, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, the uh, Natural the, History, the Museum of mm -hmm. Natural History. 
uh, you know, yeah, yeah, there's a tremendous amount of culture and commerce and, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's on anybody's short list, along with London, yeah. Paris, and you know several other mm -hmm. several others. And, and even if I we would go have put Hong Kong on that list a few years ago, but now the communists have suppressed yeah. freedom. There. Oh boy, yeah. Uh, so even Atlas Shrugged, a lot of scenes take place on the Taggart Estate, which is on the Hudson. Mm -hmm. That's where Eddie Willer's oak tree is that he that he sees riding away when Frisco comes. It's Frisco. He's running, you know, up the hill. Coming, you know, coming from from yeah, the when, so Atlas when Jim Shrugged, Taggart, when young Jim Taggart gets the motorboat for president, he can't handle it. Ten, and Francisco's like ten years old and he jumps in, he handles it expertly. That's presumably that's on the Hudson, right? That's, that's right, right. down at the base of their, that, uh, their that's estate. right, Rockdale Station. Yep, yeah. that that Dagny works. So Ayn Rand clearly glorified the Hudson River uh, in her two uh, greatest works of literature. And there were others as well. You know, we mentioned movies, we mentioned fine arts. So all of these things come, you know, I, th th there's one man that there that is the reference point there, one name. Well, and one last thing in New York City, the, the newest neighborhood where, when I lived in Hell's Kitchen was called Hudson Yards. It's absolute beautiful, you know, a beautiful part of New York City in, in the 30s. Uh, west of 9th, uh, towards 10th and 11th Avenue. So Henry Hudson's legacy just continues uh, to this day. Well, New Amsterdam, the Dutch colony, and the entirety of New, uh, New Netherlands, like you said, was conquered by the British, roughly 1660s, if I remember. My yes, that is true. They used yes. to teach that in fourth grade, New York history, remember, in the, in the, in the fourth grade? I don't know if they 1664, teach mm -hmm, they took over. Mm-hmm. And you, uh, 1664, and uh, New, Amps, New Amsterdam becomes New York, and becoming you know British colony. And of course, we know, we know the we know the rest. You know that uh, you know the American Revolution becomes mm -hmm. you know frees frees those colonies from the British. And New York becomes this tremendous commercial center, and I think part of the reason for that is the Dutch influence. Right, yes. the the Dutch emphasis on commerce. commerce. Yep. Yeah, I remember when I was in college, Robert. I was doing a, I did an independent study on on New York history for Sister Ann Kessler, who uh, who just passed away like in the, recently. At a hundred, she was over a hundred years old. Wow. Uh, very, very, yeah, very good history professor. Mm -hmm. Um, and she was interested in, in the in the New York history. And there was a question that was you raised in a number of these books. You know, well, granted, New York had this great harbor, but there are other places up and down the East Coast of North America that had great harbor. Why did New York become the leading commercial center? And I think the answer is the Dutch influence. You know, the absolutely the, the, the I, emphasis absolutely. on commerce. They called they called these merchants the peak of the morning boys because they were up at the crack of dawn, you know, yes. working, waiting for yes. their ships to arrive so they could unload yeah. and you know and you know, sell their yeah. merchandise and. This book goes. definitely covers that, Andy. Uh, 17 different languages in New Amsterdam. If you walked out in the 1600s, there would be seven diff 17 different languages of people trading. You know, it has always been about commerce uh, as a central hub. And one other one other point, Andy, that, that while well, you spoke, reminded me, the Erie Canal. So what the Erie Canal did a, a couple of decades later in the 1820s, it took all the shipping that came in from Europe and then through the Hudson was the gateway to the rest of the United States. Into, into the Great Chicago. Lakes. Yeah. yeah into mm -hmm. the Great Lakes. And, and um, yeah. yeah. And speaking of which, we just we were just discussing that in the film course, you know, how the West was won. We see the families heading west. That's right. In the 1830s, yes. 15 miles on the Erie Canal, right? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the gateway. That's right. That was the gateway to... To, to the Great Lakes, and and like you said, that's part of the reason Chicago, you know, was able to become this major metropolis. Mm -hmm. It was, it was mm -hmm. connected. It was connected to the Atlantic and all the trade, you know, uh, across the Atlantic through the Hudson River. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, exactly. Through, through yeah, the through the Hudson lakes River. to the Erie Canal, yep. you know, to the Hudson River. <laughs> it's a long route, but you know. There was no interstate highways there, no transcontinental railroads, and certainly no jet travel. Right. So there was the only game. In, it was the only waterways were the only game in town. You're not going to go overland, you know, mm -hmm. in 1830 with or 1850 with 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 heavy goods. There were very few roads, right? mm -hmm. so the waterways were the uh, were the ways to travel for yeah. people, especially for heavy goods. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's time to salute. Yeah, this I man think we did. This... I think we did. Yes. Thank you. 
Thank you, Henry Hudson. We regret the sad end for you and your young son. Yeah. But we we definitely admire your great accomplishments. That is right. Thank you for, for that. And we always salute the courage. You know, being an explorer is always dangerous, That's but especially right. back then when there's no telecommunications. Once you're out of sight right. of land, you're on your own. Gee, you know, right. it's not, not like you yeah. get on the satellite phone. London, we have a problem, you know, like you know, even Jim Lovell in Apollo 13, 230,000 miles from home, was probably uh, better off yes. than Magellan or Hudson or Columbus when, once once these guys are across the ocean because he's in contact with you know Lovell and the Apollo 13 crew in contact with some of the greatest scientific scientific yes. and engineering minds in the world down in Mission mm -hmm. Control in Houston where these guys are completely you know Hudson's completely on his own once he's you know out, out long ways across the Atlantic so mm -hmm. we salute the, the tremendous courage of being an yes. explorer absolutely. So, once again, everybody out there here on land, I think we have an inspiration, inspiration, sad in its ending, but still, you know, a story of great accomplishments and as such, of great courage, as such, of tremendous uh, uh, inspiration. Uh, so I think we could use this to, you know, try and emulate these uh, great, great men like Henry Hudson to become, you know, the heroes and heroines of our own lives. So we'll see you right. once again next week back here on The Hero Show.